In this session, we're going to be leaving the one dimensional box behind and looking in higher dimensions. We're going to start looking in two dimensions and hopefully this will build us on to thinking about it in more and more detail. So when we extend to two dimensions, we have to think about what went on in the one dimensional box. Well, we reasonably well understand how we got to this wave function for the particle in the one dimensional box. If not, make sure you do understand the one dimensional box before we move on. The two dimensional box is much the same, except we now consider x and y dimensions. So we have a wave function for the x dimension and a wave function for the y dimension. These axes are what we call orthogonal. They have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Orthogonal is an all-encompassing word which can mean perpendicular under some circumstances. In this case, yes, they are perpendicular. They have no component of each other in the direction of the other, so we can say they are orthogonal. What this means is that we can consider the x and the y dimensions independently. And we can find the overall wave function of the two-dimensional system by multiplying the two constituent wave functions together. So our xy wave function is simply a product of the x and the y wave functions together. Okay, so the best way of trying to visualize this is to work through an example. So let's work through an example where we're calculating two-dimensional wave functions. I've parked the x and the y wave functions here for convenience, but it's worthwhile you spending some time working through this as well. What we're going to do for the sake of simplicity is we're going to let the x dimension and the y dimension be the same. So we're just going to say that they're both equal to L. So we're dealing with a square box. So let's picture our square box, we or square plane rather. So this plane here is square. We're looking at it in perspective view. We want to try and calculate what the value of the wave function will be at each of these coordinates, A, B, C, D, and E. For simplicity, we're just going to let the quantum number of x be 2 and the quantum number of y be 1. And we're going to calculate the value of the wave function at point A at coordinate 0, 0, point B at coordinates L over 4 in the x direction, L over 2 in the y direction, C, L over 2 in both directions, D, 3L over 4 in the x direction, L over 2 in the y direction, and E at the LL coordinate. And we want to calculate the values of Psi at each point. Okay, so let's start working through this. Let's look at point A. Point A, we're told, is at coordinates 0, 0. So we should see fairly rapidly that once we look at sine of nx, remember nx is equal to 2, ny equals 1. When we look at the x coordinate, the sine of the x, the sine function of the x coordinate is going to be nx, which is 2 times pi times 0, all over l. We know already that that equals 0, so psi x comma 0 is likely to be 0. That's not a surprise to us. And we'd expect to see exactly the same thing for the y coordinate. So we're going to say that psi a is equal to 0. OK, 0 times 0 gives 0. And that should not be a surprise to us whatsoever, because remember, it's at the edge of the box. If it's at the edge of the box, the overall wave function has to be 0. That's our boundary condition. By the same token, we can say that e is at the other side of the box. OK, it's also at the edge of the box. It conforms to the boundary condition. So psi e, we would expect to be 0 as well. OK, that's 2 dealt with very quickly and easily. Let's look at psi c. This one gets interesting. So let's, again, look at the sine function. The sine function is where the interesting stuff happens. So look at the sine function. Psi x for point c. We're going to look at the sine function for this, and we end up with um, psi x at point c is going to be related to, proportional to, sine, remember nx is 2, so we have 2 times pi times x, well what was the value of x? x is l over 2 divided by l. Okay, 2's cancel, l cancels, leaving us is proportional to sine of pi. Well, sine of pi, remember, plot your sine function. Pi is in the middle there. Sine of pi is equal to 0. So psi of our x coordinate is going to be equal to 0. OK, so we would expect that our psi c to be equal to 0 as well. 
This seems surprising, but A, C, and E are all going to be zero. Okay, well let's look at what's happening to B and D. At point B, our coordinates, remember, are L over 4 and L over 2. So let's look at what happens for the x. Psi x is going to be equal to root 2 over L times the sine. Nx is 2, remember, so we have 2 times pi times x, which is L over 4, divided by L. Our L's cancel. We have the 2 and the 4 cancel. So we're finding root 2 over L times the sine of pi by 2. Go back to our sine curve. And we know that at pi it's equal to 0. But at pi by 2, it's equal to 1. So psi x is equal to root 2 over L times 1. Let's look at psi y. It's going to be root 2 over L times the sine, remember our n for y is 1, times pi times L over 2 divided by L. L is cancel. We end up with pi by 2 again. So we'd expect psi y to equal root 2 over L. When we multiply psi x times psi y, we expect to get root 2 over L times root 2 over L gives us 2 over L. Okay, that's our value of the wave function at B. What happens to the wave function at D now? If we look at D, at points 3L over 4 and L over 2, well, we already know psi y. We calculated it in the previous example, which is equal to root 2 over L. We just need to find psi x in this case. Well, that's equal to root 2 over L times the sine Remember, remember nx is 2. Multiply that by pi times x, which is times 3l over 4, divided by l. l's cancel. 2 and 4 cancel to give 2. So we're having sine of 3 pi by 2. Again, go back to the sine function. Pi there, but pi, 3 pi by 2 is here, so this gives us minus 1. So psi x is equal to root 2 over L times minus 1, which is equal to minus root 2 over L. So at D, psi xy is minus root 2 over L times root 2 over L gives us minus 2 over L. When we look at all of our wave functions, when we tabulate these all together, we have our value of psi a is equal to 0, psi b is 2 over l, psi c again equal to 0, psi e, sorry, psi d is negative 2 over l, and psi e is equal to 0 again. So what we're expecting to see on this sheet is we have 0 at a, c, and e, so these must correspond to nodes in our distribution. But at B, we would expect to see a peak, and at D, we'd expect to see a trough. When we indeed visualize this, we see that X and Y vary independently. Okay, we have the separation of variables term because they are orthogonal axes. And when we visualize them, remember we have these wave functions here. We have a full sine wave for X, remember N equals 2, but only a half sine wave for Y, N equals 1. And when they combine, they form a surface. So we're expecting to see a peak at B, and we're expecting to see a trough at D. And when we look at the overall picture, that's exactly what we see. We see this sheet with two waves going across it, multiplying together to give this unusual shape. It can be tricky to visualize it, so what we've done is we've created a link for you to click. This link will be in the video description for you to be able to visualize what this looks like. It'll be an interactive link. You'll be able to rotate the model and see what it looks like. So let's start picturing it. What happens as nx and ny vary? Well, if nx and ny vary, we don't expect to see a single node in either one, and that's fair for what we see in the wave function. So we see a single hump oscillating up and down. If nx is equal to 2 and ny is equal to 1, we see this hump 
structure that we saw before. We can see this node here, but we have one peak and one trough. So we have a node in the x direction, but no node in the y direction. Things change when we allow both of them to equal two, and we see a node in the x and a node in the y, and they alternate, and we see alternating peaks and troughs across the wave function. And if we allow x to equal one and y to equal two, we see we've got that peak and trough again. Again, can be tricky to visualize, so we've got a couple of links for you to visualize this. And we've got a second link that will allow you to visualize what happens in real life on similar surfaces, and the wave structure is very, very similar. Because it's tricky to visualize this in three dimensions like this, we're going to look at it from the top down. So where the bright spot represents a peak and the dark represents the lowest point on the graph. So for the 1-1 one, one surface, we see a peak in the middle and zero all the way around. For the 2-2, two, two, we see peaks in two of the corners and we see troughs in the other two corners. And likewise for the 2-1 and the 1-2 situations, we see the alternating peaks there. It's important to recognize this is what happens when there's a difference between LX and LY. So when the X and Y dimensions are fundamentally different. When the two dimensions are exactly the same, however, we see a special case arising. We end up with a square surface. We see much the same wave properties for the 1-1 one, one, and 2-2 two, two surfaces. But looking at the 2-1, two, 1-2 one, one, two surfaces, we see something different happening. What we see is that these are exactly the same shape, but rotated through 90 degrees. This is the phenomenon of degeneracy happening. This is where we have exactly equal energies for different values of n. So when we have this degeneracy, we have two distinct states of the same energy. You've already come across the principle of degeneracy when considering atomic orbitals. Your d orbitals, your p orbitals, they are degenerate. Your px, py, pz, all the same energy, but distinctly different. Whenever we have this equality in dimensions, we have, we have this degeneracy arising. Our wave function simply becomes the multiple of the two wave functions together, remember, exactly what we did before, where the L terms multiply together because they're the same value. We get nx, ny. When we put these values in, the only thing we find is that the L term becomes a constant. So it doesn't matter what the value of nx and ny will be. And this gives us equality in energy between the 1, 2 state and the 2, 1 state. It doesn't matter whether x is 2 and y is 1, or x is 1 and y is 2. We would still get the same energy. They're still distinctly different, but they have exactly the same energy. And this is the phenomenon of degeneracy. It's a fundamental result of symmetry in any system. If we have symmetry, we expect to see a level of degeneracy. So far in the quantum chemistry, we've confined a particle and found that it quantizes energy. We looked at it in linear polyenes and what happens when we restrict the particle's movement there. There is an increase in energy linked to the increase in number of nodes. So the more nodes we have, the higher the energy of that state we would expect to see. When we moved into two dimensions, we saw that wave functions can be combined and we can treat these orthogonal wave functions independently. And simply, a two-dimensional situation is the product of two one-dimensional wave functions, provided they are orthogonal to each other. We can then extend that model to three dimensions, four dimensions, and so on, as many dimensions as we need. We rarely need more than three. But you can see the principle just multiplying these wave functions together. And anywhere that we have symmetry in a system, we would expect to see a level of degeneracy.